get a roll call? Yes. Uh, good evening. Damian Cole. Yep. David Jackman. Earl Brennison. Juan Martinez. Here. Kathy Stanfield. I have seen her. Yes. I see you, Kathy. <laughs> Kelly Orr. Michael, I see you here. Here. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Michael Gothard Hutchins. Here. Michael Lansborough. Paul Hewen. Uh, Ryan Bernadette. I see Ryan. Here. And Su Ting Shin. Here. And not in attendance. Uh, Panas Stouffer will not be here. Paul Hewen will not be here tonight. And for staff, we have Marquise Williams, Vanessa Lacer, Graham Dollarhide, and Thomas Sunamaka. Great. And I think we do have a quorum. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, moving down to item two, the verbal instructions required by Assembly Bill 219. So I'll read the required text. If you're participating via Zoom to provide public comment during the meeting phase or during the meeting, please make sure your computer or device has a working microphone. Use the chat feature to submit a request to make a comment. When the time comes to make public comments, you will be invited to speak. If you are participating by telephone to provide public comment, you should have contacted RTC agency services prior to 4 p.m. yesterday and provided the telephone number you would be calling from, as well as the item or items you wanted to comment on. When the time comes to make public comments, you will be invited to speak. Um, and so with that, we'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Su Ting to move on to item three and run the meeting from here. Great, thank you. I don't see anything in chat either but I will triple check, perfect. Um, item number three, um, I do not see any in chat. I'll go ahead and check for hands raised. Number three is public comment. That's what it says on my agenda. Unless... Okay. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. I just want to make sure that there's public comment. Um, Would you like to make public comment? I'm checking for chat and I... raise me. Uh, Maya from Strong Towns is okay. So I just to... want to confirm. Okay. Oh, yes. So I'm just trying to confirm, like all the places that I'm trying to check, and I'm just trying to get a verbal confirmation that you are liking to make public comment right now. Uh, I I can go ahead uh, if you'd like. Sure. Great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. No, yeah. So go ahead. I just wanted to check and you said yes. And now it's your turn to make public comment. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, anyone who knows me is aware that I, in uh, the Strong Towns Discord chat, I've been talking a lot about the uh, biggest little bike network project. And uh, although I do see uh, some very good improvements in some areas, a lot of things that are necessary for keeping uh, bicyclists and pedestrians more safe in the downtown corridor. I am seeing a lot of uh, questionable things uh, and some of it's not good. And some of it is not really good at all. Um, I have some visuals that I could show, but uh, to be brief, basically it's, it's the lane configurations, and since uh, the project manager doesn't seem to be uh, willing to change any of the actual curbside arrangements, um, the project's uh, changes are limited essentially to whatever is in the existing road space, which in some cases is going to create really sharp curves for large vehicles uh, for the protected intersections. Uh, to be specific. And also, um, I began looking at the Virginia Street Corridor uh, roll plots last night. And I started from 9th Street, and I was going to work my way down. And on the very first block, I saw some major problems. Um, 
the the 800 block of North Virginia Street, if anyone's not familiar with that, is uh, directly off of the freeway entrance. This is the area that Kerry Kosky had spoken up so vehemently, uh, vehemently about uh, not placing um, bicycles on Center Street one block over. Well, the designs that I'm seeing for for the project now are I would look. I would like to see what Kerry Kosky's opinion is of these because they look very dangerous. Essentially, what at the thirty percent phase uh, design phase, um, I'm seeing the bike lane still in the same configuration as before, sandwiched in between two car lanes. One of them being the the bus terminal on the Hennard block next to the new uh, business school, the school of business building that's being built. And they have a couple of gaps in the protection. They have uh, curved barriers, but they have these like 30 foot gaps in that protection for people making a right turn on ninth, which completely defeats the purpose of having the protected barriers in the first place. And uh, buses are going to have to make a really sharp turn left to be able to get out of the bus lane to continue going north on Virginia Street. Uh, things like this, it completely defies the logic of the entire project. In fact, I would even argue that currently it is safer than what it would be with curbed barriers because at this point, if some catastrophe happens on the street, I can get around it. But if I have these curbed barriers in the middle of two lanes, I'm not going to be able to make any maneuvers anywhere without getting out off my bike and, and putting it over there. Let's say if I want to catch the bus at that station, uh, it's going to make it more difficult. I would have had to had the forethought of getting off of the bike lane at the previous intersection on 8th Street and walk up with my bike. This if is you make... could go ahead and finish up, that is, I was muted so you didn't hear my timer, but we're wrapping up on your three minutes. Oh, I didn't know I was limited to three, three minutes. Um, in the agenda for public comment, yeah. it's just three minutes. Okay. Yeah. I There's another opportunity because... at the end of the meeting. Oh, I, I understand. Believe. I understand. Um, it's unfortunate that RTC made the decision to stop having CMAC member announcements. We used to have our own section, and that's been removed. So I really think we need to bring that back. Um, so, yeah, I'll go ahead and end my comment here. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other public comments? I see some members. Oh, I see Maya my, my here. If uh, you know where the... Where so, you, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Um, Maya, you can go ahead, please. Uh, okay. Um, so, I've got three minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, I, um, I wanted to bring up transit access to and from the airport because I fly um fairly frequently and it's always a really uh jarring experience to come home to reno and uh i basically have three choices i can either drive my car four miles from downtown to the airport and pay per day to park it there which is very expensive uh or i can use a ride share which cost is variable sometimes it's cheap and sometimes it's not um or I can take the bus, which is possible, but um, the bus stop is on Terminal Way outside of the airport grounds. It's a very unpleasant place to wait because it's a fairly high-speed road with a narrow sidewalk. You're basically just sitting there getting blasted by road dust the entire time you're waiting for the bus. It only comes once every half hour, once every 60 minutes on Sundays. So I had the unfortunate experience this past Sunday of uh, flying home. And uh, Uber wanted $30 almost uh, to get me from the airport terminal to my house four miles away downtown because it was busy. Um, and so I decided that I was going to wait for the bus. So I hauled my suitcases outside the airport grounds, past the shuttle pickup spot for the casinos, past the rideshare spot, all the way out to Terminal Way. And then I have to sit there for almost an hour to catch the bus. Uh, it's just a really unpleasant experience, and I think it's very strange that there's no, uh, and I, I know that the airport authority is a separate entity, and this isn't necessarily RTC's fault, and I don't know the history because I'm relatively new here, but I think it's really bad that 
there's no seems to be no collaboration between the airport and the local transit whatsoever. Uh, if you're using one of the casino shuttles, then you can just walk right outside the terminal and get picked up right outside the terminal. But if you want to use public transit, then you have to leave the airport and wait by the side of the road uh, for very infrequent service. Uh, it's, it's really bad and it just makes me feel bad about living in Reno every time I come home. It's really unfortunate. I just don't think that expecting people to shell money out for Ubers or airport parking every time they want to use the airport or uh, just say, well, of course, you've got a friend or family member who can pick you up, right, is reasonable. Thank you for your public comment. Um, hopefully, if it ever is a topic on the agenda, we can circle back and share when that date will be, um, when it does make it on our agenda. Damien? Yeah, uh, Maya, I just wanted to uh, make a comment about So that. I um, just, I don't think that public comment allows for discourse in this setting. Sorry, that's the timer. Oh, is there something Maya else totally... we're supposed to be talking about? In is there a specific agenda item? No, so there isn't. My understanding, and Marquise, you let me know, and Ryan, you let me know if I'm wrong, and Vanessa, I think, is also on the call. My understanding is that public comment, people can say the thing that they're going to say. It can, or it doesn't have to relate to a specific agenda topic, but that there is no discourse and that there is no direct addressing of what anybody says during this time. Like, this is your time to say it. And we say thank you for your comment and it gets recorded into the minutes. I would recommend that anybody who makes public comment is on the next call to check and verify that what they said was represented accurately in the minutes. Um, and my hope as chair is that eventually some of these things that we talk about are maybe put together into an agenda item on, on a further agenda, which is not today. And that I hope that there is some connectivity with, if it does make it on agenda, we can circle back to the people who made public comment so they can be here for that discussion. But Marquise and Ryan and Vanessa, you let me know if I'm wrong. Like we don't respond to and have conversations about public comment at this time. So the only people that I'm really hoping to hear from at this specific moment is Marquise, Ryan, and Vanessa. And if there are no other people wanting to make public comment, we actually move on to item four. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, suiting. Thanks for that explanation. That is. Um, a, accurate representation um, or interpretation of the public comment and the, the use of pub public comment time. Okay. And then we do have to interrupt. This is this is Vanessa. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Uh, this is the format of public comment. It's this is very standard for government meetings. Um, but I would like to add that the comments are recorded and we do summarize uh, discussions uh, that happen at CMAC and our other committee meetings. And we will relay that summary. So for instance, with the bike network comment or the airport comment, we'll relay that to our internal staff or our stakeholders. Um, so we do move that along uh, and we also summarize it for our board. So it is on the record. Um, it's just not, uh, again, we have agenda we have an agenda for a reason so we can get through, you know, the topics that we need to get through. Um, but we do listen and we do make sure that those comments are heard by those who need to hear them. And I wanted to clarify, Vanessa, so number five is information and discussion items. And they are usually like presentations that we're hearing from um, RTC staff. Would that be an appropriate time to for this committee to discuss items or things? or because there are no specified presentations, we can't talk about those things. Madam Chair, I rise to ask a question. Um, I just asked a question to Vanessa. I'd like to know the answer before we move on from there. So the agenda states that there are no items under number five. Um, so we, we do not have any items on this agenda to have, we don't have open discussion on this agenda. If that's something that this committee wishes to um, add in the future, we can certainly look at that. Um, again, we would want to retain that public comment framework, but then, you know, we can talk about uh, perhaps uh, next meeting, uh, if that's the desire of the of the committee to talk about having sort of an open discussion, or um, indeed, if you wanted to add items to the agenda, how we would do that. Okay, 
I think we would like to be able to have some place for CMAC members to have discussion, regardless of whether there is an agenda item for a specific topic or not. So okay. either be member announcements or just when the agenda is like, sometimes the agenda is long and we can't do that and we understand. But when the agenda is light, that seems like a good opportunity for CMAC members to just bring, you know, like what whatever their experience is out in their their role in the community. Um, and we've talked about this before, right? Where we're, we're cycling through and having some updates for bicycles and pedestrians and bus riders and things like that so that we stay connected to the people that we're serving. That's great. And I would recommend that um, you and uh, the vice chair work with staff to um, kind of figure that out and then bring that back to the committee next meeting. Okay. I, I don't really think that's a new thing I'm saying, but who specifically then should Ryan and I talk to again or um, in the, you know, in between to. Yeah. Uh, so I think working with Marquise to develop the agenda for next month. Okay, Marquise, we'll do that. Thank you. Is there, is there a desire to add an agenda item for this month? I think there, if there is space for CMAC discussion, just amongst members and staff, it just seems that when the agenda is light, it's a great opportunity to ask questions. The biggest little bike network just got, you know, out into the world and has gotten some feedback. Um, it just seems like a nice time to check in about some of these things when we don't have three presentations that we're trying to get through and are a lot of time. Absolutely. So we do have a quorum. So if a member desired to add an agenda item uh, to the agenda, um, we would need to go through the process. There would be a motion to add an agenda item. That member would state what item it is. Um, there would be a second and then a vote. And if the vote passed, then you would have a new agenda item. So you you have the can we do that now? Uh, you have yeah absolutely you can do that now. Right. Do I hear a motion to add an agenda item to discuss CMAC related topics? I think somebody else, maybe perhaps other than me, if somebody would like to make that motion. Uh, uh, I'd like to make a motion. Was that Damien? Yes. Thank you. Um, Damien is making a motion to add an agenda item today to discuss CMAC related topics. Do I hear a second? I think really quickly, do we want to um, maybe narrow the focus of the agenda item? Um, maybe Damien, you could specifically add an item about discussing the biggest little bite network. Well, um, according to Robert's Rules of Order, the motion would have to be seconded first, and then during discussion, fr friendly amendments to the motion can be made. Sure. Do you second so we can discuss, Ryan? Sure, I second. <laughs> Thank you. Ryan seconds the motion. I'm open to discussion to either make, as Damien said, friendly um, amendments to the motion, um, or if anybody has wants to say they don't want to do it or they do want to do it or reasons why um, the goal is to, at the end of discussion, be able to vote on whether or not we'd like to add that agenda item or not. Real, real quick, a, a quick staff per, or, you know, perspective. Um, we might want to set a time limit on, sure. on this discussion. Uh, I'll defer to you guys. Obviously our allotted time is, you know, Typically, we go till seven o'clock, and I don't. I know this is a fairly light agenda, so um, I'll leave it to the committee to uh, to throw out a time. But I think there should be some kind of time limit on the open discussion. That sounds fair. I'd like to propose an amendment to this agenda item that's just that states that we will we will discuss any items for twenty minutes and then review if we would like to go longer. Just so, just so that I know that there's a, I feel like this meeting uh, really qu heavily, you know, quickly went into a very bureaucratic situation, and I want to make sure that members who, um, you know, everybody has a chance to speak if they do want to bring up something. So I just want to like this first, let's do this first block at 20 minutes, and then we can keep going from there, probably ending at seven, strictly. Ryan, may I, this is Vanessa, may I offer another suggestion? Sure. Perhaps the agenda item could be added, added, the new agenda item could be added after the agenda items that are already on the agenda so mm -hmm. that we can complete those scheduled agenda items and then uh, address the new agenda item. 
Absolutely. That sounds great. Damien, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to comment. Uh, first of all, this is actually how meetings are supposed to occur according to the uh, Robert's Rules of Order, so I'm actually rather happy about this. Um, uh, secondly, I would like to say, uh, as far as I know, uh, the uh, policy for uh, this body does not have a set allotted time. It seems that the 7 o'clock uh, pumpkin hour, if you will, uh, has kind of it's, it's been informally adopted because people like to get going by seven. I don't have a problem I setting a, a, I don't, I mean. I, I'm sorry, I don't yield the floor yet. I would like to say that uh, I don't mind having a, uh, a time limit for a discussion about a, a specific item. Um, but I just want to point that out, that we really don't have a, a limited time for these meetings. I think that it's actually very important that we allow them to continue as long as needed for the business items to be uh, to be discussed. Thank you. I think the calendar just has to have an end time. You can't schedule a Google calendar or anything without an end time. Um, that's that's all I was going to say. Any other topics of discussion before we're ready to vote on the amended motion? Ryan, do you want to either say your amended motion again or amend your amended motion? Well, I would like to go ahead and say that I absolutely uh, accept what uh, amendments he's made. So, yeah, if you would like to set a, a specific, if if Ryan has a specific uh, topic that he would like to discuss regarding CMAC matters, then I'd be up for adopt adding that to the measure or to the motion. Um, I just don't know what specific thing that he's referring to. So, I I personally don't have any. I thought it would just be nice to allow the members to have the opportunity to bring up anything on their mind the way that we used to. <laughs> we used to have that before we had final public comment. Now we, now we don't have that opportunity anymore. We used to have uh, member announcements and that would usually be the place where people would bring things up. So I don't want I, I have no idea why that was removed. Yeah, I want to, I still want to make sure that everybody has a chance to speak and that we can freely discuss. I, I think I just wanted to make that amendment so that, um, when the, the minutes come out for the next meeting, it's just obvious, you know, specifically what we discussed. And uh, I also wanted to add a time limit there just so that we can move to different topics um, easily. And if anybody, I just don't want anybody to get bored and leave the meeting because we're just <laughs> going back and forth about bikes. And, you know, not everybody yeah. in the CMAC is necessarily concerned about bike networks. Right. Um, yeah, so I think the, the amendment that I proposed uh, was just to... Um, I think give this 20 minute block of discussion a title, which I think, I think bike network, the biggest little bike network is, I think, on everybody's mind. So I think we'll start there for 20 minutes. Sure. And see, yeah. yeah. So do we need to take a vote? Um, are there any comments on that? Or are we good to vote? I would say that at this point, if there are other things that you'd like to talk about that are not on that, that are more general, it should either be added to this amendment or be presented as a separate motion. Okay, hearing none, um, Ryan's amended motion. Um, we're voting yay or nay. Um, so if you are a member of CMAC, you are welcome to vote. If you are not, um, you're welcome to stay muted for this portion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Um, and I think, Vanessa, that suggestion is that we'll add it to the end. Um maybe after RTC staff announcements um, before the final public comment um, so that we don't lose anything that we were trying to do until then. Quick question. Did anyone else lose the window for the meeting because it suddenly disappeared from my screen? I'm trying to refind it. Oh, there it is. Oh, oh, it got minimized. Sorry. It's okay. I'm yeah. glad you found all of everybody's beautiful faces. <laughs> it disappeared. Okay, so um, moving on to item four, um, seeing no other public comment requests in chat or by raised hands. Um, moving on to number four, we're gonna we're approving the September fourth committee meeting minutes. So if you have it up and you'd like to review them, this is a great time to do so. It was sent out with our agenda packet. 
Okay, and if somebody feels ready, you are welcome to motion to approve the September minutes as presented. Is Hi, Kelly Orr, or for the record, I make a motion to approve the September minutes. Thank you, Kelly. Do I hear a second? A second from Ryan Bernadette. Thank you, Ryan. Um, any questions or discussion items on this before we vote? All in favor of approving the September minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed? Excellent. Minutes are approved. And then we are moving on to number five. Um, you may read the long description, but there are no items in this section. So unless staff has things to add at this time, we will move on to number six. Yeah, let's just move to six. Great. RTC staff announcements. Yeah, I have a couple uh, brief announcements here um, that we can go through and then move on to the uh, added item. Um, the first is about the CMAC 2024 annual appointments and reappointments. So thank you all. Um, I know there was a, sh a quick turnaround time for uh, getting those reappointments or expressing your interest or disinterest if you're here your interest in continuing on the committee um so thank you all for staying along um we included um in the attachment that went out at about one o'clock today we um, included a list of all of the members that we will be taking um to the board at the October meeting for reappointment. The term will be effective um, oh, uh, immediately, and will the term will run through June of 2025. Um, in June of 2025, CMAC meeting, we'll do another reappointment. So this will be an annual process. I know in the past it's been a three-year term and there's been some differences there, but with the 2023 um, CMAC procedures, uh, we did, the, uh, we have uh, changed it to being an annual term. Um, so we have two new members, uh, Amanda Nelson and Richard Landon, who aren't in attendance tonight, but um, they are representing transit. Uh, and so they will be, we have quarterly meetings where we do transit updates. So they'll definitely be in attendance at those meetings and providing their valuable feedback on the ground wisdom. Um, and uh, I, I'll have to check on when that uh, next transit meeting is, but we'll welcome them to the discussion. Um, so that's the, any, any questions on or clarifications on the reappointment process? Yes. So for clarity, could you remind us who has left? Um, I can. Um, we have three members that uh, are no longer on the panel. Um, I don't have that open, but I can pull it up fairly quickly. Um, Marquis, those three are Anne Silver, Eric Ammerman and Michael May. Thank you. Thank you. And then would it be appropriate at this time just to go around and kind of acknowledge everybody who's here? And maybe if there is a specific part of the multi part of the multimodal, um, just to kind of get a feel for who, who we've got. And if we are trying to recruit any additional members, what populations we may want to try harder to include. Yeah, I think that's a good exercise. I'm not sure that we're quite ready to open the recruitment at this time. It's something that we'll definitely want to look into. And uh, we do want to make sure that we have a representative body. So maybe it is, uh, I, I think that that's fine if, if members on the call would like to go through and just give a, a reminder of, um, what their interest or uh, and who they're at, which community they're advocating for, we can do that. Yeah, so I think just for brevity, what we're looking for, right, is the specific group, and it could be more than one. So that could be cyclists, pedestrians, bus riders, you know, something 
in that vein. Um, maybe geographic location in terms of like where you either live or travel to the most. I think that helps us figure out what what we know about and sort of have eyes and ears on. Um, and then if there's a special population, either kids or mobility, you know, or something where that might be relevant. Does that feel like enough and a fair way to do that? That that sounds fair. Um, let's maybe go, uh, Su Ting, I guess you can lead, um, maybe start with you, yourself and the vice chair and then go down the, the roll call. Yeah. Um, my name is Su Ting. Um, I have a, I have young kids. So for uh, six and nine, um, I like to ride my bike. I like them to ride their bike and I like us to ride bikes together. Um, that is my primary. That's what I know. Um, Ryan? Sure. Uh, I'm Ryan Bernadette, the vice chair for CMAC, and I primarily commute by bicycle and by bus, but I'm also very interested in maintaining accessibility options for the community. You want to call on the next person? Sure. Uh, Michael Hutchins. Um, yeah, Michael Gothrop Hutchins. So um, my primarily bike and bus. Um, my up until last week, that included the regional connector, but we're in the process of having the office relocated up to Reno. So we're, I think you might have lost your only regional connector passenger that was on CMAC. Uh, uh, um, still, still going to be doing bike and bus, though. Michael, can you tag a next person? Um, uh, yeah, I'll just tag the person who's after me on my screen and send it to Damien. Hello. Yes, I'm a 17-year resident of Reno, Nevada, always living downtown since I've moved here. Um, primary mode of transportation is bicycle. I also use the bus and occasionally ride share if needed. Um, and that's my concentration of study, trying to help the community get a uh, much more equitable multimodal transportation network and that's pretty much it i mean i i'll just hand it off to who say who hasn't gone yet kelly Any... good kelly. evening hi i'm quietly in the background um there might be a little echo so i apologize my name is kelly or I am a community director at uh, a property in North Reno off Red Rock. My primary means of modes of transportation is uh, my vehicle, my bike. I do bike to work. Um, occasionally, I am a longstanding community member who's used all resources of Washoe County and RTC, and I am very much um, interested in providing more accessible transient for transportation for our communities um, out at large um, in the county areas even, but um, more likely getting into the city and um, especially for our seniors and um, our community members with needs. So that's, that's me. Um, is Juan Martinez on the line? I don't see him in the gallery. Okay. Hi, my name oh. is Juan Martinez. I am low vision and I do ride all public transit. And uh, I also uh, like to go for walks on public sidewalks that are safe for me. And uh, I used to, I, I do take uh, Uber and Lyft, but sometimes it's hard to get that because the wife and I have a a guide dog and they always reject us so it's hard for us to get on on one of those and that's that's, that's it thank you and we have some new rtc staff members and i think just maybe for the purposes of not everybody knowing who everybody is um does rtc staff want to take a second and introduce yourself we will start with marquise and then let you bounce your way around yeah, we can popcorn it. So I'm Marquise Williams. Um, I've been with RTC for a year and a half now. Um, I've 
worked in Northern Nevada for about three and a half years. I was down in Carson City for two years before RTC, um, doing transportation planning down there, originally from LA, worked in transportation there. So happy to um, lead the active, the newly formed active transportation program um, and work with all of you and um, folks around the community to really have a community driven process on how we get bike networks, sidewalk networks, multimodal networks integrated with our into our city and region. Um, and I will um, bounce it to Vanessa. Maybe Graham. Hi, Sorry, we're not just gonna call people. Oh, uh, hi, Graham. <laughs> Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, my connection's unstable, so got my camera off today. But um, I'm a planning manager with RTC and um, been here a little over two years. Um, came to RTC from NDOT uh, and prior to that, Carson City um, with a transit background. And i um, happy to be here and happy to, to chat with you all. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Tom or Thomas Sunimoto, and I've been with RTC a little over two weeks. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I've uh, got a background in geography and environmental consulting. And yeah, pretty excited to be more involved working at RTC. Well, and then Lolita is here, right? Or was? Or he was earlier. Yes, I'm here. Oh, oh there you Wonderful. Go. Could you introduce yourself for us? Yes, I'm Lolita Davis. I send out the invites, send the information to you guys. I assist Marquise with the meeting. I've been here a little over three years. And prior to this, I was with Sacramento Regional Transit for almost 10 years. Wonderful. Thank you. And sure. Vanessa is unmuted. Hi, uh, apologies if I missed it uh, earlier. I had to step away quickly. Um, I'm Vanessa Lacer. I'm the planning director of uh, RTC. Um, just started at RTC about three months ago. And I have a background in um, transit. I worked for transit uh, agency in North Carolina for about six years um, and in transportation and transit planning. Um, I've also worked in multimodal transportation at, M at, at MPO in uh, North Carolina. And um, so I'm, I'm eager to uh, forward any kind of active transportation or alternative transportation. Definitely always looking for ways to get cars off the road and um, have safe connections for folks. Great. Um, perfect. I think we got all the CMAC members and RTC staff. Um, feel free to jump in now if you miss me. me and my. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> um, I primarily ride the bus, but I also um, ride a bike. And I'm interested in improving the bus line. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was really helpful um, just to kind of know where we're at. So sorry. Thank you, Marquise, for letting us take the time to do that. Um, and then I think there was a second document. Yeah. So um, I, I spoke a little bit at the previous meeting about our commitment, um, our well draft commitment to accessible meetings. And this is just so that everybody, that we have... Um, or we examine whether our meetings are are accessible and um, easy to understand and and comprehend for anybody. Uh, so I can share my screen. This was a an attachment that was shared. Excuse me. Um. Uh, my name is Juan Martinez. I'm sorry to interrupt, but sure. what is your name? Uh, this is Marquise Williams with RTC. Oh, he muted yeah. himself. He, uh, Juan muted himself, so I think he, I think it was just asking who this was. Got it. Um, okay, um, so let me share this, and this was also included as an attachment in the email sent earlier today. 
Um, so we can just go through the uh, the commitment here uh, line by line, and if people want to jump in or if anyone has comments or thoughts, um, we can. We're we're going to look to bring this to you guys for approval at next month's meeting. Um, so if you have comments now or if you want to email me um, with any comments, then we can try to incorporate them into final document. So RTC is committed to inclusivity in public meetings. The following standards will be followed during CMAC meetings to ensure accessibility. So pre-meeting, we commit to um, having meeting agendas posted to the RTC website and sent to committee members at least 48 hours prior to the scheduled CMAC meeting. Typically, uh, those those will come in um, a week, uh, you know, more than 48 hours, but, you know, in case of uh, emergency or, or whatever, we are committing to 48 hours. Um, additionally, and this is a fairly new one over the past two meetings, any presentations or visual aids related to agendized items will be shared with members by noon on the day of the meeting. Um, moving on at the beginning of the meeting, attendees will be asked to state their name before speaking. Any changes to the agenda will be clearly stated. So after the roll call, list members will we'll list the members who aren't in attendance and we'll also list the names of any guests or staff who are not on the roll call but are in attendance um, for each item we're committing to read aloud the item title and the name and position of the person who will address it we will describe photos and maps and if anything is written in the chat um, we'll read it aloud at the next opportunity. Um, for that last bullet point there, um, you know, when you're presenting, sometimes it's hard to see the chat. So chair, vice chair members, uh, help us out um, gently when you, when necessary. Um, moving down, when asking a question, this one is uh, for the members. The questioning member will state their name before asking a question. If another member wishes to add on to the question, that member will state their name as well. Uh, questions from members will be answered in the order received. The chair will ensure that members on the phone with questions are given an opportunity to speak. Um, public comment will be available at the beginning and the end of the meeting. And finally, for approval of items, the chair will call for a motion and a second, then solicit any further discussion. Once the discussion concludes, the chair will call for verbal votes using aye or nay, and then announce the results. The chair can adjourn the meeting without a vote. Um, so these are kind of the, the, the rules that we're committing to. Uh, it's for both members and RTC staff and folks joining. So it's it's a learning process for everybody, and um, but we do want to hold ourselves to a high standard and make sure that we have accessible meetings. So with that, I'm definitely open to any comments or questions or clarifications from the group. Damien, uh, you have your hand? Yes. Um, small concern. I don't know if it would ever become something that we have to worry about, but ending the meeting without a vote, does that mean that the chair can end the meeting before the agenda has been concluded? I believe that the way it's written is that um, when we get to that item, we'll, we'll progress through the agenda as written. Um, but when we get to the adjournment item, we just don't have to have a motion for adjournment um, and a vote. Um, we would just, the, the chair, when we're on that item, can. Yeah, just, it, it might want to be clarified with the uh, staff before that is presented for <laughs> for adoption. And the second thing I had is um, how... It's not clear to me how the committee members can request items to be added to the agenda of a meeting prior to the meeting beginning. 
So Vanessa stated earlier that we would do that by communicating with Marquis. Um, I guess the clarification right. maybe is can general can members contact Marquis directly to add members to the agenda, or does it have to go through, you know, Ryan? Or me, yeah, I guess. It's, it's it's not stated in the policies. That's why I'm wondering, because it would be wonderful if it were. And I know it's not pertaining to this document specifically, but if this document's going to be added yeah, on I, to Yeah, uh, I think Marquis can probably answer that question though. Yeah, and this is definitely an evolving process. Um, different uh, folks, we've gone back and forth with um, how to best uh, have folks on the on the committee uh, give give a an idea of what they want to hear about. Um, we will definitely uh, have to have a subsequent presentation or, or discussion about this. I think we'll definitely discuss it internally because we do value the, the feedback and the uh, comments and the experience of the folks in this body. Um, so there should be a mechanism where um, you're all invited and able to speak freely. Um, the logistics of that and making it equitable and relevant and useful to RTC staff um, is something that we definitely need to put a little bit more thought into. Um, but we'll, we will definitely do that. I think that's a, yeah, that's a I, I have seen, um, presentations given by committee members of other bodies, such as the Chicago mayor's bicycle council. And, uh, they're wonderful. In other words, it doesn't necessarily need to come from RTC, these presentations. I think it would be great if the floor could be opened up to members who have uh, items that they wish to discuss and have that information conveyed to RTC, maybe on items that they hadn't previously considered. It's a valid point. Thank you. Okay, hey, any other comments or questions about the document that was presented? And I would just like to add that I think, you know, it, um, if it ever feels like your needs are being met in terms of like what you're able to access to bring it up again later, right, Marquise, if there's something that we notice as it's being implemented, um, where we are either not understanding or not being clear um, to still speak up. Absolutely. Yeah, this this is a this is your meeting to um, interface with RTC staff members. And, and so if you have something that you'd like to communicate, please um, make sure to use your time. Great. That's just for receiving, right? Like we're not voting on it. This is um, this is a draft form. So next month I'll bring this um, without I mean, the main change I'll make is to delete the word draft. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll bring it to you guys and we'll um, have a vote to approve. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And, and then a couple couple other items that aren't on the agenda. The one is uh, just a quick housekeeping item. Um, if possible, we, we do send out a an email um asking about whether you'll you're planning to attend the CMAC meeting if if possible um please try to respond to that it's just helpful for us to know in advance whether we'll have a quorum um you know we're not going to be barred from the meeting if you say no and then can show up or say yes and then can't show up but um you know it's nice for us to be able to establish uh just a, a rough idea um and then, oh man, there was something else I wanted to mention, but um, yeah, any other staff comments? None for me. Thanks, Marquise. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that's it. Great. Thank you. And then we will move on to we'll say somewhere between six and seven, um, which is our added agenda item. Um, so that Ryan Wright was about the biggest little bike network. Um, and we'll set a timer for 20 minutes, which will take us to about 6.40, um, just to kind of keep an eye on time and keeping things moving. Um, 
uh, I'll open it to the floor. Um, but if anybody from RTC could at least have either the website or some of those visuals handy um, in case we needed them, that we can quickly share those and view those. Um, and then with that, I'll open it to the floor. Damien, go ahead. Hi, yes. So if I may quickly share my screen, I think visuals would help cut down the number of words that I need to speak. <laughs> um, can either, do you want to, or do you want to have somebody like just very briefly describe what the biggest little bike network is for those people on the call who... Oh, if, if uh, well, just want to be specific. Uh, yeah, I was going to be speaking specifically to a, a specific block of the network that's being proposed. That's that's what I was going to uh, to talk about and present. That's fine. I guess I just, if anybody wants more context, I guess maybe oh, either oh, read in the chat. I just want to make sure we all know what I know what you're talking about. I've seen the plans, um, but I just want to make sure that everybody who is listening. Yeah, if, if anyone from RTC would like to kind of give people a general intro if it doesn't take up too much of the 20 minutes yeah i can read um quickly a, a short paragraph from the rtc website that kind of intros this program so the rtc of washoe county and the city of reno are launching the biggest little bike network a collaboration of improvements to infrastructure in downtown reno that will improve safety and access for cyclists pedestrians and drivers this is a quote, um, protected bike lanes, intersections, and floating bus stops will make it significantly safer and easier for people of all ages to visit downtown. That's by uh, the project manager here at RTC, Sarah Going. She continues to say, we are looking forward to sharing some of the early designs with the public at our pop-up events uh, this weekend, which is referring, referring to last week. Um, we are at the 30% design phase, so it's a perfect opportunity to get input from the community. For more information on the Biggest Little Bike Network, visit www.biggestlittlebikenetwork.com or contact RTC. Could you do us a solid and just paste that in the chat for sure. anybody who is following at home? Thank you. Um, Damien, I guess back to you. I, thank you. Thank you, Marquis. Thank you. That was yeah, no, thank you very much, Sue. So to be brief, because I... I kind of went over the, the overview of what it is that I was speaking about during the public comment. And if Google Earth will work with me here um, to give people an idea of the area that I'm speaking about. This is Virginia Street. This is as we're heading to the very contended on ramps and off ramps for Interstate Route 80. So I'm going to turn this to the side. And so on your left, side of the screen is north. I'm very sorry, by the way, um, um, Juan, I understand all of this is visual, but I will try to be as descriptive as I can in, in my verbal uh, presentation here. We're looking at a block, zooming in on a block of North Virginia Street, which is just north of 8th Street and 9th Street. This used to be populated by various motels, tattoo shops, little missing middle type apartment buildings. And uh, we also have Roberto's Tacos and a couple of uh, historic buildings that have been around uh, houses uh, for like over a hundred years. This area was redesigned in 2021, repaved completely as you see it today. Prior to that, it was pretty much like a strode. It was uh, quite dangerous and there have been sidewalk improvements. Sidewalks look like they're about 10 feet wide now and the median in the middle um, of the street is about 12 feet wide. Here at this intersection, there is no protection for pedestrians crossing the street, uh, crossing Virginia Street at 8th Street. You can see that the median uh, does not extend out into the intersection and the crosswalk was not brought back to get out of the intersection during this redesign, a very unfortunate decision by whoever made this. So this is what is current. Now I'm going to switch over to my Adobe Illustrator version of this. This here is what is presented on the roll plot, the, the plot rolls, um, which has been presented on the website for Biggest Little Bike Network and uh, at the kiosks. 
you see the, this is the configuration that is being proposed. There is a bike lane. Hopefully you can see my cursor. It's a bit small. I'm very sorry. Uh, there is a bike lane that is in between the bus only lane and the car area. And so technically this makes three lanes of traffic and the bike lane is in the middle, just like how it is now. The only difference being made is that there are concrete curbs to give some very rudimentary protection for bicyclists. Uh, additionally, the proposal does not provide protection for pedestrians at the same intersection I was speaking about earlier. Uh, in usual pedestrianized models, the median is taken into consideration. Some um, modifications could be made to this median and the uh, zebra crossing could be brought back out of the intersection into this area to be protected. So in case if someone doesn't make it across the street all the way, they have some refuge. Um, so the additional problem with this is that Oh, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and put the comments. I have been making several notations for a video that I'm going to be uh, presenting on YouTube regarding this situation. So as you can see, buses need to cut through the bike lane and enter the bus only section. And then to continue north to the university, they need to make a very sharp curve, a left turn again through the bike lane and wait behind cars that might already be there. So there is a high possibility that buses can completely block this protected bike lane, as you can see by this red circle here, this little bike. Additionally, cars making a right turn onto 9th Street also have to cross that very same thing. So if a bus is already blocking it and then a car needs to make a right turn, it's going to turn into a pile up here. Currently, since there are no curbs for the bike lane, it's arguably better and easier to traverse because number one, bikes can use the bus lane easily, which I've seen them do very often, or sometimes they just completely skip this section and use the, the, the sidewalk. So all of these notes here, I don't have, I'm trying to keep it down. Um, Juan, if we want to talk later, I can show you all the different notes that I have for this. So I'm going to bring up the changes that I proposed just for this particular block. This is how I think it should be done. The green lines are where the bicycle lanes are. They are on the sidewalk. The sidewalks have been extended out to a full 20 feet. So that provides five feet for a buffer with the trees. And it also provides a step up for any uh, vehicles entering this business here where there's a, a drive inlet. And on the top side, it's exactly the same thing. It, I'm hardly taking any additional sidewalk space from what is currently being used. What I did was I brought the curbs out toward the center of the street. So this means that drainage and utilities would have to be worked on, just like how they were worked on in 2021. Unfortunately, this would have to be a redo. Um, additionally, the bus stops are fully accessible to the bike lanes. In other words, if you stop your bike, you're right there at the bus stop. There's nothing preventing you from walking five feet over to get your bus. It disentangles all of the car traffic from the pedestrian and wheeled pedestrian traffic, if you will. And that's pretty, I mean, and also the uh, intersection here is now uh, protected for people crossing the street. The uh, crosswalk has been moved. This is not possible with the current scope of the project for the biggest little bike network. I think that's important to stress. Uh, they are currently only looking at the available street space between the curbs. This is the biggest limitation that they're suffering from. Uh, in addition to this paradigm that I keep in, uh, uh, encountering, which is, would you rather have many bike facilities laid out cheaply and quickly to get it rolled out as, as fast as possible, or do you want to minimize it to a certain few streets and make the facilities better? Obviously, you can see what side of this argument that I'm on. I think it's somewhat of a, a, uh, a misleading paradigm that's being created, which is there's a goal that's being set, which is to, uh, to activate the 51 to 56 percent of vulnerable road users, otherwise known as people on wheels or pedestrians, who wants to use bike facilities, who are 
actively trying to, it's like, ah, I want to make that jump. I want to get on my bike and stop driving. And this is what would do it is, is, is providing facilities that are cheap, but accessible at the same time, making it as effective as possible. So I don't have data in front of me to say bringing out the curb is going to cost X amount of dollars or that it's going to require a lot of changing of the infrastructure underneath the street. I don't have that information. RTC does and we know public works does. I think this is what they should be aiming for. And that is, will will make the most effective transition possible. And remember guys, everything that I'm talking about here is what Reno Public Works and RTC argued for during the micromobility pilot program because they said center street cycle track can't happen because it's too dangerous and we need to focus on Virginia Street instead. That was the entire argument. Well, then we got to make the best darned bike network possible for hundreds of students who want to get to Midtown, who wants to get to downtown, who wants to get to the Riverwalk and don't want to drive. That's that's what my whole thing's about. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I have um I I want to make sure we're clear on something. So you said that the scope of the project is limited to available street space and since we have Marquis on the call, I just wanted to see if that is like is the scope of the biggest little bike network limited to like I just want to make sure we're you know understanding what the limitations are of this project and if a bigger change needs to, you know, just like making sure that the message, right message gets to the right people at the right times for the scope of the project. And since he's here, I'm hoping that Marquise, you can chime in on whether that's true or not. Yeah, so I am not a subject matter expert on this particular initiative. The The Biggest Little Bike Network does predate the active transportation plan. And I know it has been studied for many years at this point. Um, there was a planning study and uh, several efforts. Typically, what I can say at a high level is that RTC projects tend to be on regional roads. So those are, um, there's a, a, a rough definition, but generally roads with more than 5,000 um, average daily trips are what we consider regional roads. Um, and those are the ones that would be eligible for an RTC project, like the biggest little bike network. Um, okay, but he's said, not, I guess, but, but this part of the road is part of that, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. And what I heard Damien say, and what I would like clarification either with Graham or, you know, just a follow up maybe on the next meeting or in between is, are the things that he's proposing things that are possible to do through the little, the biggest little bike network, with the curbs and extending things in that way or are are you not or is this project not allowed to touch or move the curbs in any way like i just want to understand where things are allowed to happen given the scope of this particular project or if there is nothing to your knowledge that prevents this to be considered as a possible option uh, that is something um, for the design team, um, and uh, maybe I'll let Vanessa add some context here. Sure. Hi, this is Vanessa. So this is not our this is not planning's project. This is an engineering project, and so I would um, defer that question to the project manager. We can certainly get an answer, but we don't have one tonight. That's okay. Will you remind us who the engineering manager is for this project? Marquise, do you know who the manager is? Oh, yeah, that's Sarah going, and I can paste her um, contact information here in the chat. It's also, um, I believe, available on. Yeah. Um, I can the, find her. I can find her uh, email. The website. Oh. Yeah, in the Base Little Bike Network website. So I can post mm -hmm. that in the chat. If I may, real quick, the uh, person oh. who told me about the scope of the project and that it's from curb to curb was by Sarah. She told me herself. Okay, that's great. I mean, that's that's fine. I just I just wanted some clarity. Yeah. Um, I have questions for Damien, but I am gonna also just check the chat to see if um anybody else might have questions. Um, and if you need me to uh, still share my screen, let me know. I think I took it off. No, it's still there, and I think having okay. that is helpful. Um, I don't see any hands, so I am gonna just ask my question. Oh, there's uh, um, Ryan. We'll follow up. 
with anybody else. Um, so I like being on the other side. I mean, for a bicycle or a pedestrian, I like being on the outside of the bus stop. Um, I think that does minimize a lot of those conflicts. Um, I know that buses are going slow enough at a lot of times where I try not to be worried about it, but being on the other side makes me not have to be worried about it, which is good. Um, I am wondering what your thoughts were about um, bicyclists like through the intersection at 9th. So if I'm on Virginia traveling north on 9th, um, just like going through that intersection and the right turn lane for cars and what you're thinking there. I haven't analyzed it yet. I was, I started okay. I analyzing wait. this last night. <laughs> it's okay. I will wait yeah. with bated breath to see, uh, like that would just be like the finishing of this part that you're showing, right? I like being on the other side. I just want to make sure that I'm not like having gone a safe block be swiped by somebody turning right. Yeah, I, for clarification, I will say that uh, if time permits, I am planning on doing a block by block analysis of every single corridor that's being proposed by the Bike Network project. Uh, so hopefully, if that happens, I might be going back to work soon. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, and I know we had, I think we talked about 20 minutes, um, and I'm just seeing who else might have questions or thoughts. Uh, it looks like Ryan either is about your either about what you've presented and talked about or any other parts of the Biggest Little Bite Network, if people have had a chance to take a look. Um, Brian, um, you have your hand up, so we'll have you go ahead. Sure, yeah. Thank you for bringing this up, Damian. Uh, I kind of also noticed when I was going this when I was going through the rule slides um, at uh, the Farmer's Market on Sunday when RTC was uh, gracious to present there. And yeah, I, I agree that I think that the new design is probably more dangerous than the original design. And uh, I do like your proposal. I think your proposal makes a lot of sense. Um, it might not be possible, like we said, given the constraints of the project, but I think you're right that it's a good goal to shoot for. And uh, I definitely agree that, yeah, having having the bus try and get out to the left while cars are coming in to the right in a constrained kind of barrier, uh, egress and degress like situation, it just doesn't, yeah. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. So I think it's good that you brought this up. Thank you, Damien. Yeah. And if I can comment on that, um, one of the ideas that I brought up to the people at the kiosk were um, putting a halt on all of these different multimodal projects until they are brought under the scope of the active transportation plan. And I told them, I feel like we're putting the cart before the horse and we've been doing that for years. Not only have we not been looking at the network as a whole to find out what the best routes would be uh, enough cur uh community involvement. I, I also feel that the routes that were picked for this project were cherry picked prior to any uh, public involvement. And I asked how come those routes were picked? And they said it came from previous traffic circulation studies. Um, I don't know what kind of political uh, moves were made during this entire time. I know that there was that big scandal about the Coranos uh, insisting that bicycle facilities be in front of their casinos and they were threatening the city with a lawsuit at one point and then all of a sudden they're like, no, there's nothing to do with that. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of that. One of the problems that I was facing when I was talking with the people at the kiosk was how these different projects fit hierarchically into each other. In other words, does one fall under the other? Where does this begin and that end? And there seems to be a lot of confusion among the different staff people that I spoke to about how these projects are essentially governed within the agency. And I think that would really help out is if there was a clear path as to what project belongs to which plan and which study and everything. And I said a roadmap and maybe even like a flow chart of how these things work would really, okay, I mean, if someone as obsessed about this as me can hardly figure this out. I'm sure that the general member of the public coming up to a kiosk for five minutes is going to have no clue. So yeah, that's, it's a big problem. Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, speaking as an engineer, there's kind of a, there's a huge trade-off between the amount of documentation that I can produce and the actual work that I can get done. And I, I do think that um, RTC is a lot more, uh, you know, transparent about these things and even a lot of other regional planning agencies. And so I, I think the, I think to your point, I think the way that I kind of look at the biggest little bike network is that something will get built and something getting built is a lot better than not having a lot of facilities in the first place. And so, um, I don't know, at some point you gotta, 
we got to trust our engineers. We have to trust our regional planners. And I completely agree, though, that it, it is difficult to follow. But, um, you know, it's sometimes you got to make the best with what you have. And I know that RTC is, you know, as, as we all know, the state of Nevada does not have a lot of money to just throw around. Um, so it is a, it is definitely a pick your battles kind of situation. Yeah, I but, know a couple of. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think, um, you know, I do hope that this. Uh, the, it, yeah, I yeah, hope to see I, some revisions, but I do think that ultimately what is being done here is very good. Yeah, I know that Mark, the policy. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so for somebody on RTC staff, could you just help us understand sort of what's coming up next? So it's at 30% right now, um, and they've done these three kiosk meetings. Um, if people still have questions or feedback or want to chime in, like what is the best way to do that? Um, are we expecting community meetings? Um, or is RTC bringing this with feedback, with adjustments to any community groups. I just want to know what we're expecting in terms of the next step of this project. Yeah, so this one is, um, like you said, at the 30, this is Marquis um, with RTC. This, this one is um, at the 30% design um, mark right now. And this is based on the schedule, the project timeline on the biggestlittlebikenetwork.com. Um, it's on the homepage. So public comment is scheduled to be opened until October 21st. Um, and the 60% design appears to be um, scheduled for completion in March of next year. Um, so between uh, November and March, consultant and staff will be working um, on incorporating comments and refining these projects and, and making some common sense changes to them. Um, that will be uh, open for review, uh, scheduled to be March with another three pop-up meetings uh, designated. So uh, with that in mind, the best thing to do is to contact the project manager whose information is available in the chat. Um, according to this website, like I said, it comment period is open till October 21st. Um, so you know, get, get your comments in and uh, yeah, we'll next, next phases in 60% design in March. Uh, cool. Sue. Thank you. Uh, Sue. Damien, go, go ahead. And then we're going to wrap up this section. Yeah, yeah very quick. Uh, just eyeballing that you were asking what I would do for this intersection. And I, it's, it was, took them like a second or two for me to realize. So I would just do the, the same treatment that I did on the previous block. This um, <laughs> this lane, if you want to call it, it looks like it's about 20 feet wide uh, because there used to be two lanes here. They narrowed it down to one. So that brings an additional 10 feet of space to expand the, uh, the pedestrian and bicycling network out. And instead of having this transition area with these two arrows, just turn all of that in the sidewalk. You have the space, take care, uh, take advantage of it. It's very basic. Uh, and the part that's not basic is budgeting it, getting the approvals, working out the drainage slopes, uh, all of that engineering and everything, you know, and getting any approvals from UNR to do it. That's, that's the hard part. The engineering, the pouring the co concrete, that's easy. So, yeah, I was able to, to identify that very quickly as, yeah, yeah, you have plenty of space to do what you, uh, what we just did, which is extend the sidewalk out. Cool. Thank you. Um, great. If anybody has feedback about just kind of like how this went, adding that item, you know, in terms of flow of the meeting, please feel free to share that. Um, moving on to item number seven. So this is our second chance for public comment. Um, it can be based on something on or off the agenda. Um, and comments are made to the committee as a whole and not to individual committee members or staff. Committee members may also provide public comment. Um, public comment is limited to three minutes, but I don't think that speaking in the first public comment precludes you from being able to speak in the second. Um, are there any people on the call hoping to make public comment? I haven't been able to talk enough. I want to make, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Maya. Um, <laughs> yes, Maya, you did it. <laughs> you raised your hand. Okay, um, you I have three to minutes. do it, not the feature in Zoom. That's okay. Okay. That works. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Um, Maya Johnson, downtown resident, uh, for the record, because I didn't do it last time. Um, so I just wanted to chime in. I've been following the discussion of the um, 8th to 9th Street corridor, or the that block of Virginia Street. Uh, I ride that pretty often um, on my way to and from UNR, from other points around the area. And uh, I definitely share the concern uh, with the whole bike or with the whole bus stop structure um, because I already have a lot of problems. Uh, I ride a scooter um, most of the time. And I have a lot of problems uh, with cars turning right. Uh, they don't expect me to be there. It's not really clear where I'm supposed to be. And then if you add buses and then um, I just don't really trust that that's going to work very well because things are going to get blocked up and um, and there's just a lot of points of conflict with vehicles where there's, I mean, even in just like, for example, I ride um, Holcomb fairly often and the, uh, the bike lane and the right turn lane from Holcomb onto Liberty uh, northbound uh, overlap with each other. And I'm sitting there waiting in the lane and then there's cars trying to turn right and I'm in front of them and it's like, am I supposed to get off the road or like, what am I supposed to do? And then if you had a bus into the mix that's trying to cut like, like this between like bike lanes and cars and everything, it's just, I don't think that's going to be good. Um, and uh, I don't really know what to say about the whole money situation um, and like whether or not or why uh, the project is limited to between the curbs. And it's just, uh, it's, I mean, you know, I'm just a, a resident who's here to comment, but it's really depressing to hear, well, you know, there's not much money because the state's poor or doesn't want to collect taxes. And therefore, like, you should just be happy with whatever you get. And like, they're not going to change the curves because that's too expensive or that's a different department. And we're just going to do this because it's what we can do. And even if it's not very good, it's at least better than, it's just really... <laughs> It, it makes me sad. So um, I want to be optimistic about it, but it's, um, I think the whole situation with, with the way they're trying to thread buses through 8th and 9th Street on Virginia, or through Virginia on that block is really concerning because it brings to light some of these underlying details of like, well, the parameters are very limited, possibly, um, for reasons that I don't think we have confirmation of why exactly that is, but it may be that it's like, well, like, you know, we've got a little bit of money, we're gonna do a little thing and the end. Um, so I really wanna like this, but it's uh, it's a concerning thing where you just kind of peel back the layers of the onion and it's like, well, we can't do that because of this problem and we can't do that. And it's, um, but yes, I share those concerns. Thank you for your public comment. You are excellent at knowing where three minutes is. You had eight seconds left. Thank you for, for your public comment and thank you for coming to the meeting. Um, Damien? Yeah, I'll make a public comment. Um, but since I'm not allowed to engage with members of the public, I'll just say it to the ether. Uh, this is part of the RTIP. It's the five-year budget for RTC that has been approved and also has been approved uh, prior to the board approval from RTC. It was also approved, this project was approved by the Reno City Council. Um, so if any changes to the budget were to be made, I could see the scope of the project being widened uh, or changing the project entirely. Like I said, I personally, if it came down to that binary, I would personally want to see great bicycle infrastructure on fewer streets, why? Because if people use it, if the politicians see it being used, if the public loves it, if it improves the city, the efficiency of the networks, the beauty of the neighborhoods, it is much more likely that future projects will be approved and budgeted in the future. That's that's my personal philosophy. My And, and regarding having bikes in the street or not, it's a very simple binary as well. If the traffic is under 20 miles an hour, you can have them in the streets. If it's above that, get them off the streets. That's the basic pre premise of it. Not, not to say don't have bikes. It means have the facilities separated from the main portion of traffic due to the vulnerability of those users. And I guarantee you, just like every other country that's doing this, including 
Minneapolis. I'm not saying Minneapolis is another country, but you get what I'm saying. Take a look at Bryant Avenue. Their bikeway on Bryant Avenue is the best. It is the top-notch standard. Take a look at the videos on YouTube by Laura Mitchell. She has wonderful explanations about how it works and just kind of goes down it. And everyone, including their eight-year-old kids, are using it. It's great. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm checking the participant list to see, look for raised hands, and I'm looking at your pictures to see if there are raised hands, and I'm checking the chat. Um, I don't see any. Um, I would feel free to unmute and jump in if you would like to make public comment at this time because I didn't see it anywhere else. With that, I exercise one of my few rights, which is I adjourn this meeting um, without feedback from anybody. This meeting is adjourned. We'll see you next month. Um, thank you for updating on availability and previewing those documents ahead of time. Thank you. Have a great week, month, day. I mean, everything. Have a great, you know, time. Goodbye. Okay, bye-bye. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.